Welcome back to Farberless Creations. I'm Ron Farber Newman, and today I'm going to show you how I made this knockoff Apple Hermes AirTag case, basically just because I wanted to see if I could. For the uninitiated, AirTags came out a few months ago, and Apple partnered with Hermes to make some leather cases to hold them on keychains, luggage, and the like. The only problem? The Hermes AirTag case costs $349, the cost of over a dozen individual AirTags. Now, I had no real use for a leather AirTag case. Though, now that I made this, I'll probably use it as the primary keychain for my 96 Tacoma. Totally Hermes target demographic. But I wanted to see if I could recreate it. Now, I've never done any real leatherworking in the past, but I was scratching for a project where I could cut precise leather parts on my laser cutter, and recreating an item that retails for $349 seemed like too much fun to pass up. I'll have the template I created available for download if you want to create one of these yourself. But, enough talk. Let's jump on in. The first step in making the leather AirTag case was deciding which one I wanted to recreate. Hermes actually makes three different leather cases for the AirTag, a keychain, a bag charm, and a luggage tag. I decided on the keychain, as it seemed the most practical for my uses. I don't have a bag that I need an AirTag on, and if I'm putting an AirTag on my luggage, I probably want it to be hidden from view. After deciding on the keychain, I needed to design my cut file for the laser cutter. To do this, I pulled the product image from Apple's website into Adobe Illustrator. The product page didn't list how big the case itself was in terms of width or height, but it did list how big the AirTag itself is, which would be good enough to approximate the case. I drew a circle, and then after setting my document units to millimeters to be slightly more precise, I set the circle size to 31.9 millimeters in diameter. With the circle as a stand-in for the AirTag, I could scale the reference image of the Hermes case down to what looked like the most likely size to fit the AirTag. I can't see where the air tag falls within the case, but the air tag obviously needs to be smaller than the width between the stitching on both sides in order to fit inside, and probably needs an extra few millimeters to account for compression between the layers of leather near the stitching. After my reference image was appropriately sized, I could begin creating shapes for the leather components. I duplicated my air tag circle and scaled it up behind the air tag to start the profile of the primary shape. I decided the best way to achieve this shape would be to turn the top vertex of the circle into a hard corner, then using the chamfer tool, break it into two evenly spaced vertices. After nudging each into place, I could tweak the angles with which they approach the sides of the former circle, and nudge and play with the bezier handles of each until the shape nicely fit the profile of the Hermes reference image. I then drew a rounded rectangle capsule shape for the belt loop to go through, and performed a Pathfinder Boolean operation to remove it. I also slightly rounded over the harsh corners at the top of the case, giving them a roughly 1mm roundover radius. The next step was creating my stitch line. This took me a bit, and I played with a few different options for this, and had I done a little research up front about how leather stitching holes are cut, I probably could have saved some time, but I was thinking I could have the laser cut these for me as well, so I wouldn't have to punch the leather with specialized tools. What I didn't know at the time was that the tools used to punch the holes for leather stitching are almost always diamond shaped in their cutting profile, which helps the thread fall nicely into the stitch and look neater from stitch to stitch. But because I didn't know this, I was trying to figure out dashed or dotted line settings that match my reference image the best. Ultimately though, I realized it would be best to punch the stitching holes into my leather with actual leather working tools, so instead I dialed my dotted line gap spacing to match the gap of the prongs on the leather stitching chisels I'd ordered, which was 3 millimeters. I'll try to breeze past the rest a little bit, as it was largely much of the same, referencing the source image and determining what would be the most likely size of the various components. The belt, that's what I'm going to call the part that folds and loops into the AirTag case, was a little tricky, as it folded twice and that's hard to measure something like that from reference images, so I kind of guessed. If I ever make another one of these, I'll likely make the belt loop a little shorter, as my finished piece was a little long near the bottom loop once assembled. The last piece was the loop that the belt threads through to hold everything nice and tight. This just needs to be the correct width. I would trim its length of size when gluing and stitching it together. With my big hands and chubby fingers, I was not looking forward to those six stitches on such a tiny part. Alright, time for the laser. For my initial prototype of the AirTag case, I would ordered a thin panel of what I later learned was chrome tanned leather. Chrome tan leather is nice and pliable, but apparently it's best utilized for things like leather seats, lightweight bags, and things like that. It's not very workable in that you can't easily chamfer corners or burnish them to make a finished edge. It's best used in things where seams aren't visible, I think. I had to do some quick learning on various types of leather, and after googling around for a while and not wanting to order the wrong thing again, I headed into my local Tandy Leather, a chain retailer of various leather working supplies. 
The fine gentleman there quickly helped educate me on the difference between chrome tan leather and vegetable tan leather, which is likely what I wanted for my AirTag case, in order to give it a nice round edge along the bottom arch of the design. Thankfully, Tandy Leather doesn't just supply things for experts or people who have been doing leatherworking forever. I was worried I'd have to buy an entire hide, but thankfully they sell craft size panels that are 8.5 by 11 inches, so I bought one of those in 2-3 to three ounce leather and a handful of other things I needed now that I was using vegetable tan leather. Before attempting to cut my parts out fully, I snipped off a small piece of leather to use to test my laser cut settings. For this, I decided on a small square with a circular hole in it. This was to kill two birds with one stone. One, I obviously needed to know what cut settings worked best for the laser, but I also needed to know what sized hole worked best for the button studs that would hold the belt portion of the air take case closed. They sell metal punches one can use to cut the precise sized hole, but I wanted to cut on the laser cutter rather than buy a specialized tool that I didn't need. So I needed to figure out which size hole would cover the top of the button stud without being too loose that it slipped off. Once I found the proper hole size and the proper cut settings, I could cut my actual pieces. You'll notice that I have a layer of masking tape over the leather. This is to protect the leather from any scorching from the cuts. It's a low-tack masking tape, less tack than even painter's tape, that I bought a few years ago, and it's meant specifically for laser cutting. I'll put a link down in the description for the stuff I use. I mentioned earlier that I would be using a stitching chisel to punch my holes, so you may be wondering why they're still in my design file. I decided I would do a light vector pass just to mark where I wanted my stitches to go. Not enough to cut through the leather, but enough to make a mark to guide me later on. For this layer, I set my machine to cut at 300 millimeters per second and 5% power. For each of these dots, it's actually drawing a full circle, albeit a tiny one, and it moves between each dot super rapidly. And it totally reminded me of a scene from one of my favorite movies. Alright, I believe you, but my Tommy gun don't! <laughs> to actually cut the leather pieces out here on my Thunder Laser Nova 3580, I used 15 millimeters per second at 10% power with two passes. Those were the settings that I found that cut through the leather nicely without overly scorching it. After the cuts completed, I carefully removed the pieces with a utility knife blade as to not to move the leather in case any part hadn't cut all the way through. With the pieces removed, I could also remove the masking tape and touch up the back of the leather a little bit. Because I had decided to use a piece of wood as a support for my leather, there was a decent amount of flare up and scorching on the back of the leather. This wasn't a huge deal as it can be sanded away and the back of the leather won't be visible at all once my AirTag case is assembled and stained. But it still strikes me as a little odd to sand leather. But all the leather working videos I watched talked about cleaning up edges and stuff with sandpaper, so I guess it's legit. Next up was staining the leather. One of the reasons I had avoided vegetable tan leather initially when I was first looking for the leather for my project was because none of them were the warm, medium-toned brown that I was looking for to best copy the Hermes AirTag case. Turns out that veg tan leather is almost always sold in its natural light beige color from the tanning process and then you dye it to the color you want before or after cutting your pieces out. So I bought an acorn brown dye made for veg tan leathers as well as some daubers for applying and went to work. The instructions said to apply, then let sit briefly and wipe away the excess. In the future, I'll wipe away the excess more quickly as I could see darker areas in the finished pieces where I'd let it sit more. Oh well, character, right? I also stained the back of the belt piece later since parts of it could be visible during regular usage. After letting the leather dye dry for a day or so, I could glue the two pieces of my AirTag case body together. I applied a tiny bit of leather glue around the perimeter where the stitching would be and then paired the two pieces together, being careful to match them up as best as I could. After holding them together for a few minutes manually, I entrusted my water bottle and a few coasters to hold them together as the glue cured. Following the glue up, I could do my punching with the stitching chisels. The set I had ordered came with a 1, 2, 4, and 6 prong chisel, allowing you to choose how many holes you punch at once. I decided to use the 2 prong chisel in case my dots were at all spaced wrong in my design file. It's a lot easier to make things line up when you're effectively cutting one hole at a time. This was slower going, but I wanted to make sure my stitching looked super professional and clean, despite me being a total noob. I did the strap first, then moved on to the main body. With the strap, I likely could have gotten away using a 4 or 6 prong chisel, but the curve of the main body definitely necessitated the slow going 2 pronged approach to make the curve nicely. With the holes punched, it was time to learn how to hand stitch leather. Huge shout out and thank you to the YouTube channel Quarter Leather for teaching me this and other things I needed for my project. 
For larger projects, Leather Pros typically use a stitching pony, which is effectively a large but lightweight wooden clamp, to hold their leather project upright while sewing two-handed. Quarter Leather has a great video, which I'll link below, that shows a great way to stitch two-handed without a stitching pony. I wasn't opposed to getting one if needed, but this is a really small project that is a little easier to handle by hand. So, since Quarter Leather has that video that goes into great detail, I'll just give a high-level overview of what I'm doing, and you can check out that video if you do want more detail. I'm using a wax-coated thread, cut a decent bit longer than I thought I would need so I didn't run out, and then with both needles in neighboring holes, you sort of leapfrog front to back, having both threads go through each hole but from opposite directions. When doing this, it's important to apply tension to the thread that you're not working with while working the other hand to make sure your stitches are nice and tight when all is said and done. Quarter Leather shows how to do this a little more gracefully, but for me, I would just wrap the thread around my back finger a few times to apply tension while working. This was the sort of thing that it took me a decent number of instances to remember the steps and feel confident in my motions, but once I got the hang of it, I powered right through it without needing to really think about it. I think this is something I could really enjoy doing in the slow-going meditative task realm that I've mentioned a handful of times. Worth noting, if you're not sticking your tongue out while you work, it won't come out right. Very important. Once you reach the end of your stitch, you'll want to back stitch a few times to make sure that your stitching doesn't come undone near the high stress areas of your project. After doing this, I trimmed the ends of my threads down to about 3 eighths of an inch and then used a lighter to melt down the synthetic thread and used the end of the lighter to rub the melted areas down flat against the rest of the thread. I performed this process on the belt portion of the case, but because it was a lot more linear, it was a little easier to work with as I didn't have to rotate it as much, and it was only a single piece of leather, so it was easier to pass my needles through. Since this was only a single piece of leather, the stitches here are purely decorative rather than functional like the ones on the case body themselves. The belt loop, as I mentioned earlier, was the tiniest piece of the puzzle. To assemble, I bent it around the area of the belt it would be securing and marked how long it needed to be. I then cut this little bit of length off with my utility knife. With my punch centered off the edge of the belt loop, I punched a hole on each side for the stitches that would span the gap between the two ends. I then used those holes to make one more punch on each side for a total of four holes for the three stitches that would be made, and there were two rows of these. With the stitch holes punched, I could apply a tiny bit of glue and then held it together for 10 minutes or so while it dried. After the glue dried, I could get to stitching it. Starting off was the same as the other parts, but I didn't want to have to re-thread the needle for each row, so I got a little creative on the back in order to have both rows of stitches share the same thread line. After doing a few back stitches at the end of the run, I again trimmed them short and then was trying to figure out how to melt the threads down without burning myself or the leather loop. What I figured out would work best was to heat up the end of a stainless steel cocktail skewer until it was red hot, then press the loose threads down and melt them in one go. I had just a few finishing steps to go. Professional leather crafters do something called burnishing to get the edges of their veg tan leather projects to have a nice, smooth, often glossy edge. This not only looks nice, but it serves a functional purpose too, to keep the fibers of the leather edge from absorbing moisture that may come in contact with, or getting frayed over time. The Hermes Airtake case also appeared to have a nice rounded over edge, so I wanted to do this on my case too. I used a leather chamfering tool to take off the hard corner of all my pieces, but on the case itself I used varying grits of sandpaper to smooth over my edge and also help remove some of the glue squeeze out I had from earlier. I finished up with 600 grit sandpaper once I was happy with the profile. Cleaning up and rounding over this edge unfortunately reveals the raw color of the leather again, so I used a q-tip with a little dye on it to re-dye my edges and let it dry before continuing. Once I was ready to burnish, I used a burnishing agent called gum trag and applied a tiny amount to the edges with a q-tip. The leather dye doesn't stink very much, but this stuff has a strong chemical odor, so I'm glad you only have to use a little bit of it. After applying, I used a cutoff piece from an old shirt to rub it into the edge. The heat from rubbing helps the gum trag tack up and then cure, whereby you can switch to the hardwood burnishing tool to further polish the edge in the groove of the tool. I did a few applications of the gum trag until my edge looked nice and glossy and sealed. And even though I only did a small chamfer on the other parts, I still applied gum trag to the edges of those parts as well to protect them too. One more step before final assembly. I bought these fancy stainless steel button studs from Tandy Leather that looked like they closely matched what Hermes used. They have a flathead backing that goes on with a screwdriver, but the guy who helped me in the store recommended I use a little Loctite on the threads to keep it secure. So I used a tiny drop of Loctite, blue formula, on the thread before applying the top to the button stud. I had never worked with Loctite before, and it's a lot less viscous than I would have imagined, so I had to be careful not to drip any of it onto the leather. 
Once the button set was installed, I could begin final assembly of all my parts, which turned out to be a bit of a puzzle, as determining the correct order of operations wasn't as obvious as I thought it would be. My confusion was mostly around how to get the belt loop around all three sections of the belt once folded, while also getting the keyring in the right spot without the button stub getting in the way of any of those things. I got it all together after a few minutes before realizing I had installed the belt upside down. The loose flap of the belt was supposed to be pointed up towards the keyring, so I disassembled and began my assembly again, referencing the Apple product listing a few times to try to think through the correct order of operations in my head. <laughs> it was seriously a brain teaser, or I was doing this too late at night. I didn't capture it very well with the camera right behind my hands, but the trick was to trap the keyring by coming through the belt loop on the bottom with a longer edge, then installing the AirTag case body making sure to actually put the air tag in the case, of course, before putting the hole of the now topmost strap over the button stud and finally through the top of the belt loop to hold it in place. And there she is, in all of her didn't cost me $349 glory. <laughs> and pretty identical to the real thing, if I do say so myself. Now I don't have any plans to make a ton of these and start a black market of knockoff Hermes air tag cases. Last I heard, they were out of stock anyway, so I guess the five people who could afford them had scooped them up already. The irony is if I did make these to sell, based on the number of hours I put into it, if I wanted to turn a profit, I'd probably have to charge in the same realm as what they're charging. But then again, I'm just one guy in his garage and basement, and I don't have their economies of scale working for me like they do. So with that said, I'm going to make the template I created for this project available for download free with the giant disclaimer that I am not responsible if you do decide to make and sell knockoff Hermes AirTag cases on your own time. As far as I'm concerned, Hermes owns this design, but if you want to make one for your own personal use and have the tools and dedication to do so, have at it. I had a lot of fun and learned a ton making this AirTag case, so hopefully you learned something too. Like I said, I'll have links to all the tools and supplies I use in this video down in the description, as well as links to Quarter Leather's videos where I learned how to stitch leather and burnish it, amongst other things. Finally, if you want to see more laser crafted leather projects from me in the future, be sure to like this video as well as subscribe so I know that this is the type of content people want to see. Until next time, cheers!